Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Okay, welcome back to uh, part two of this review of semiconductors. I just want to remind you that we're covering a lot of material. I'm stating results. I'm not deriving them. My goal is to refresh you with some things that you know from your previous courses to state some key concepts that we'll be using throughout the remainder of the course. So let's dive right in. We talked in lecture two about carrier densities and how we relate electron and hole densities to Fermi levels and things like that. Now electrons and holes have to flow in order to conduct current and make a useful device. So this review is about carrier transport, how electrons and holes move in semiconductors. And this is quite a topic. I teach a semester-long course on this topic, so all we can do is to hit a few highlights and some key points that we'll need for this course. So these are the topics that we're going to be talking about. Uh, near equilibrium diffusive transport under low bias, high field transport that occurs under large voltages, something we'll call non-local transport that I'll explain what that means a little bit later, and ballistic transport, which is becoming more and more important as devices get smaller and smaller. Okay, so let's begin by thinking about equilibrium. I'm thinking about a two-dimensional sheet of electrons in the conduction band. So it has some width W and some length L and two contacts at the top and the bottom. If I'm in equilibrium, and if I have a microscope and I can look at this, at the electrons in the conduction band, they're executing random thermal motion. They move in a direction for a while, they scatter off of a lattice vibration or an impurity or whatever, and they bounce off in another direction, and they just execute a random walk. Uh, we're in equilibrium, so no current is flowing. On average, the velocity is zero, but there's a lot going on microscopically. Now, the, these electrons have some kinetic energy. If they were moving in 3D, their kinetic energy would be 3 halves kT. K is Boltzmann's constant. Since they're only moving in 2D, their energy is just kT. Now I can also relate their kinetic energy to their effective mass. So for simple energy bands, the kinetic energy is 1 half effective mass times average velocity squared. Okay. So that allows me to equate the kinetic energy to the thermal energy and to get a simple expression for the root mean square thermal velocity. And if we plug in typical numbers, we'll find that this, this is about 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. So even though it's equilibrium, there's no current flow, the electrons are really zipping around at a pretty high velocity inside the semiconductor, they're just going nowhere. Okay, in equilibrium, we have a Fermi function that tells us how the states are occupied. If we're only interested in states that are very much above the Fermi level, then that's a non-degenerate semiconductor and we can drop the one. And our probability of occupation becomes an exponential. If I relate the energy in a simple energy band to one half effective mass times velocity squared, then I can relate this probability not to energy but to velocity squared. And in 2D, velocity squared is vx squared plus vy squared. So the bottom line is that the probability of a state being occupied is proportional to e to the minus mvx squared over 2kt. That's a Maxwellian distribution of velocities in thermal equilibrium. If I plot that, if I plot the probability of a state being occupied as a function of velocity, I get this symmetrical Maxwellian shape. The width of the Maxwellian is related to the temperature of the electrons. Now the average velocity of the electrons is zero because for every positive velocity we have a negative velocity that cancels it out. But if I just look at the average velocity of the positive half of these carriers, just the average velocity of those that are moving in a plus x direction, that's something we can compute. And I won't go to the details, but this is a very important velocity that we'll see over and over again. The velocity is square root of 2 kT over pi m. This is the average velocity of electrons moving in the plus x direction only. This is known as the unidirectional thermal velocity. We're assuming a non-degenerate semiconductor with Boltzmann statistics. 
So you'll notice that there are different thermal velocities. The one in the previous page was the root mean square thermal velocity. The one that we're going to make the most use of is this unidirectional thermal velocity. They both have a numerical value on the order of 10 to the 7th, but it's going to be important for us to keep these velocities straight. Okay, now let's apply a bias and see what current flows. This is a problem that we're really interested in. So electrons will come in a contact, they'll undergo a lot of scattering and do a random walk, but if the bias is low, they'll have slightly more probability of going out the right contact than they will of turning around and going back out the left contact that they came in at. Okay. The average distance that an electron moves before it scatters is called the mean free path, and that's going to be something that will be very important for us. So this is a random walk. There's just a small chance that it will go from the left to the right a little bit more often than it goes back to the left. So the electron is zipping around at the thermal velocity, but its average velocity is really quite small. There's a small average velocity from the left to the right. So the question that we have is how much current flows? Okay. And we can do that by remembering that current is charge divided by time. So it's the total amount of charge in this resistor divided by the time it takes for that charge to flow across the device. The total charge, so if I think about this as a sheet of electrons that have a density n sub s of electrons per square centimeter, I'll multiply by, by the area of the sheet and then by minus q because that's the charge on the electron and that'll give me the charge. So Q sub n is the charge in coulombs per square centimeter. And then the time it takes the charge to move across the resistor is just the transit time. It's the length of the resistor divided by this small average velocity that they're drifting at. Okay, so all I have to do now is to plug the charge and the transit time into the expression for current and we get a simple expression for the current. And it's more or less what we would have guessed. Current is proportional to charge, coulombs per square centimeter. It's proportional to the average velocity that the electrons are moving. The faster they move, the more current that we have. And it's proportional to the width of the resistor. The wider it is, the more current flows. So we have a simple expression that we'll use over and over again. Now let's look at how the magnitude of this small drift velocity depends upon the voltage that we apply or equivalent, equivalently on the electric field that we apply. So we know Newton's law says that momentum is related to force. The PDT is equal to the force on the electron. And we know from freshman physics that the force is minus Q times the electric field. So if the electron starts with zero momentum and it moves for a time tau, its momentum will increase by an amount minus QE times that time tau, and that increase in momentum is effective mass times the increase in velocity. So the increase in velocity I can then solve for, it's minus Q tau over M times the electric field. And if I assume that at every scattering event, on average the velocity that it starts with when it starts to accelerate again is zero, then the average velocity is just this delta V, and we find that the average velocity that the electrons are drifting at is just minus Q times the average time between scattering events over the effective mass times the electric field. So the average velocity is proportional to the electric field. Make the electric field twice as strong, the electrons go twice as fast. They're negatively charged, so they go in the opposite direction of the electric field. And the constant of proportionality is a, an important material constant that we call the mobility. So if we plot the average velocity, the magnitude of the average velocity versus electric field, it's just a straight line. And the slope of that straight line is the mobility. Now, we're talking here about small electric fields or small applied biases. Under these conditions, you know, we observe a linear relation between the average velocity and the electric field. This corresponds to a low voltage between the drain and the source of a MOSFET. Okay. But we might want to apply higher voltages and we wonder what would happen then. 
Okay. Now, before we do that, I want to look at an, another way that current can flow, and it's by diffusion. So let's think about a resistor, but instead of applying a voltage across it, I put a contact that just absorbs electrons, and I inject electrons from one side, but there's no electric field. Now, if I inject electrons, they'll undergo a random walk, and you know some of them will go from the left to the right, and when they hit the contact, they'll just be absorbed and not come back. Now, if I want to compute the current in this case, I would expect that this is a diffusion current. You know, Fick's law says that particles flow down a concentration gradient. So there's some density of electrons inside this resistor. The concentration gradient is dn dx. They flow down the concentration gradient, so there's a minus sign. And the constant of proportionality is the diffusion coefficient, d sub n, the fusion coefficient of electrons. Okay. And the units of d sub n are centimeters squared per second. Okay. And you may remember that Albert Einstein discovered that there is a simple relation between the mobility we talked about on the previous slide and the diffusion coefficient that we're talking about on this slide. And that simple relation is that d over mu is equal to kt over q. Okay, in general, we have both concentration gradients and electric field, so we write what we call a drift diffusion equation. We add the component due to the drift in the electric field to the component due to electrons diffusing down a concentration gradient, and then we get the total current, and we relate d and mu with the Einstein relation. Okay. Okay. All right, now... Uh, I want to mention another important concept here called the electrochemical potential. Remember in equilibrium, we had a Fermi energy and we talked about what its physical significance in and why it's so important. The Fermi energy is really the electrochemical potential in equilibrium. And it's like the water level. You fill up the states and you fill them up to some level and the water level or Fermi level is constant in equilibrium because there's no flow of electrons or, or water or whatever you have. Now if I apply a voltage, current will flow. And the Fermi level gets replaced by something that people call a quasi-Fermi level. It's really the electrochemical potential. It's like the Fermi level, but now we're out of equilibrium so it can have a slope. So I can relate the electron density to the quasi-Fermi level or electrochemical potential out of equilibrium. Now, if I go back to my drift diffusion equation, if I do a little bit of algebra using this relation between the quasi-Fermi level and the electron density, I can show that the current can be written in another way. Carrier density times mobility times the gradient of the electrochemical potential. Now that's actually a very fundamental way to write the near equilibrium current. It's really the place that a proper transport theory begins. And then we would, we would show that under certain simplifying conditions that they can be simplified into a drift diffusion equation. So these are two different equivalent ways of writing the current equation near equilibrium. Now I also want to point out that uh, we can relate the mobility and diffusion coefficient to some microscopic parameters. The mobility is q tau over m, so it's related to the average time between collisions. The diffusion coefficient has units of centimeters squared per second, and we'll talk about this more later on in the class, but the simple expression for the diffusion coefficient is that it's the unidirectional thermal velocity times the mean free path divided by two. So you can see that the units are right, centimeters per second times centimeters. So it has the units of a diffusion coefficient, and it's a very simple expression for the diffusion coefficient. Now we also have this Einstein relation. So in practice, what happens is that we will frequently be given the mobility because it's something that's easy to measure. We can deduce the diffusion coefficient from the mobility with the Einstein relation, and then we can deduce the mean free path from the diffusion coefficient with this simple expression. So the point I want to make, and that we'll return to several times in the course, is that when we need to estimate the mean free path, we can do so from the measured mobility. 
Okay, so we've talked about near equilibrium. We call this diffusive transport. Even if there's a small electric field, carriers are basically undergoing lots of scattering and they, they're undergoing a diffusive transport with a small bias in the direction against the electric field rather than, uh, rather than equal probability in both sides. Let's very quickly look at a couple of other aspects of transport. So if I look at high electric fields, what I'll find is that the drift velocity is no longer proportional to the electric field. In fact, in semiconductors like silicon, if you make the electric field higher and higher, you'll find that the, the, that the velocity just saturates at about 10 to the 7 centimeters per second, and we can't make the electrons go any faster. And that begins to happen when the, once the electric field strengths are higher than about 10 kilovolts per centimeter. And the maximum velocity, as I said, was about 10 to the 7th centimeters per second. Now, just briefly, what's the physics behind all of that? Yeah. Velocity is minus mobility times electric field. Mobility is Q tau over M. We would expect that the higher the voltage we apply, the stronger the electric field, the more energy the electrons would have. The more energy they have, the more often they tend to scatter. You know, there are higher energy, there are more states to scatter to, there are more mechanisms that can kick in. So the higher the electric field, the higher the energy, the higher the energy, the shorter the time between collisions, the shorter the time between collisions, the lower the mobility. So that's the physics behind this velocity saturation. So you can see that we could describe this, we would have to describe the mobility now as a complicated nonlinear function of electric field. It's only independent of electric field for very small electric fields. Okay, now is this important in small MOSFETs? Well, let's take a look at a typical MOSFET. You know, even the best technologies these days, they're even smaller than 32 nanometers. But let's take 32 nanometers if we apply a volt between the source and the drain, we have a 32 nanometer channel length. That is an electric field of 300,000 kilovolts per centimeter. It only takes 10 kilovolts per centimeter to get in this velocity saturation regime. So we would expect in a small MOSFET to be deeply inside that velocity saturation regime. Okay. And we would expect to have to use this field dependent mobility. Now I, I want to show you some detailed numerical simulations here just very quickly so you can see what really happens inside a MOSFET and what we're going to have to deal with in a simple way when we understand how these devices work. These are simulations. Each dot represents an electron that's being tracked through a MOSFET by a computer under the influence of the electric field and all of the scattering events. This is the source, here's the channel, here's the drain, lots of electrons in the source and the drain. Here's the conduction band profile. And the region near the drain has a very strong electric field for which we would expect velocity saturation. Now, if we just go through and we compute the average velocity of all of these electrons versus position, this is the result that we will get. And the thing that you should notice is that the average velocity in the channel is way above this saturated velocity, even though the electric field is very, very strong and we expected them to saturate. They would saturate at that electric field in bulk silicon, but this channel is so short, in this case it's 30 nanometers, which is a typical channel length these days, that the electrons just don't have time to scatter very much before they're out to drain. So the velocity doesn't have a chance to uh, saturate. It can be much higher than 10 to the seventh. And we can't think of there being as any unique relation between the local electric field and the mobility. This is what we call non-local transport or velocity overshoot. And it's an interesting uh, set of transport physics that we're going to have to deal with later on in the course. But we'll show that we can deal with it quite simply. Okay, so we've talked about near equilibrium transport, high field transport, non-local transport means a transport that doesn't depend in a local way on the local electric field. And finally, I want to mention ballistic transport. So ballistic transport is actually the easiest of them all. Because in ballistic transport, an electron comes in a contact, injected at some angle, 
just zips across the device and goes out the other contact. So we simply inject electrons at different angles, they go across, they don't encounter any scattering, and they just come out. In this case, the sample length, the channel length, needs to be much shorter than the average distance between collisions so that most electrons zip across without scattering. Okay. So um, a couple of other details now. So I'll, I'll point out that uh, a lot of our focus will be on ballistic transport, understanding MOSFETs in the ballistic limit, because that's where technology scaling is taking us. And that's not the traditional area that we focus on when we teach courses on MOSFET physics. But we'll find that it's very simple to understand the, the physical concepts and even to treat the mathematics of the problem. Now, just a couple of other things to state here before we go on. You know, from time to time, I'll talk about K-space. What do I mean when I'm talking about K-space? If you've taken semiconductor courses, you know what I mean. But the basic idea is this. In a classical particle, energy is momentum squared divided by two times its mass. Electrons in a crystal are quantum mechanical waves. Their wave function has a part that reflects the periodicity of the lattice, and it also has a part that just expresses the, the propagating wave nature. And that wave part of the wave function has a wave vector k, and you'll remember that the definition of the wave vector k is 2 pi over wavelength lambda. Now it also turns out that the momentum, something that we call the crystal momentum, it's not actually the real momentum of the electron, but it, it behaves as though it, it is the momentum of a classical particle. If I take h bar, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, times the wave vector k, it has units of momentum, it behaves like momentum in the crystal, and it's something we call crystal momentum. So detailed calculations will tell us how energy depends on the wave vector of the electron wave. And the velocity of the electron wave packet is really related to the gradient of that energy band structure in K space. Now for the simple bands that we're going to be dealing with, energy is related in a very simple way to the wave vector K. It's just h bar squared K squared over 2m. H bar k is momentum, so it looks like p squared over 2m. The velocity I get by taking the gradient, so I take dE dk, and I end up with just h bar k over m. That looks like crystal momentum divided by m. So for simple parabolic energy bands, electrons behave as though they're classical Newtonian particles, and that's mostly what we're going to be doing. Now, when we get down to details and we compute actual band structures, you can get some very complicated band structures. What saves us is that the Fermi level will be located somewhere within the band gap, and the states in the conduction band and the states in the valence band, the states that are near the bottom of the conduction band and the states that are near the top of the conduction band are nearly, parabolic, nearly parabolically related to K. So this simple expression of the band structure works reasonably well for most of what we're doing. I'll also point out that there can be many equivalent spaces in, in this Brouwen zone or this region of K-space. If we're looking at the conduction band of silicon, there are actually six equivalent valleys. So we'll sometimes have to, when we're computing densities of states, bring in some details of these band structures. For example, in silicon, we showed this simple relation for parabolic bands earlier, but we'll have to multiply by the fact, by this valley degeneracy factor, g sub v, which for electrons in the conduction band of silicon is six. There are six equivalent spots in K-space that have a density of states that looks like this. So these are various details that we will have to uh, pull in from time to time, but mainly the course is going to be focusing on the underlying physical concepts, which are rather simple to appreciate and understand without getting into too many of the details regarding band structure. Okay, so that wraps up the second of two lectures on a review of semiconductor fundamentals. Uh, next lecture, we'll, we'll be ready to dive into MOSFETs. We talked briefly about near equilibrium or diffusive transport. Uh, we talked about high field or hot carrier transport, non-local transport, and ballistic transport. So in this course, we will be uh, wanting to go all the way from near equilibrium diffusive transport to ballistic transport because that's the regime that 
MOSFETs operate in these days. And we will be using a different approach to transport. And I'll be spending a couple of lectures on this Landauer approach, which is a very useful approach because it takes us all the way from ballistic to diffusive. Now, really small devices, we would get into a region of transport called quantum transport, where we can't treat the electrons as semi-classical Newton uh, semi-classical particles with an effective mass that obey Newton's laws. They're really quantum mechanical entities. That's a topic really of current research. And while I'll mention that at the end of the course, the course is really focused on how we understand MOSFETs from a semi-classical perspective. Okay, so good luck. And with uh, the next lecture, we'll dive into MOSFETs themselves.